My name's Alexis Wiggins, and I'm the author of The Best Class You Never Taught, How Spider Web Discussion Can Turn Students into Learning Leaders. It's a book out by the publisher ASCD. And I wrote it a few years ago to highlight the most important tool I've ever found for teaching in the classroom. It transformed my teaching and my classroom culture over a decade ago when I discovered it. And I've been honing it ever since and sharing it with educators all over the world, just like you. So I want to take you a little bit today through the how and why spider web discussion is so powerful. And I like to start with a question, which is this one. What is the ultimate purpose of school-based education? When I run workshops, I often start with this question and I have people come up with this individually in groups. So I'm just gonna give you a second to think through this question for yourself right now. If you had to write down on a piece of paper, what is the ultimate purpose of school-based education? Go ahead and bang out a sentence that you think would answer that question accurately for you. So if you thought about it a little bit, um, you probably came up with something pretty idealistic, something that connects with your vision of why you got into education in the first place. And the truth is when I do this in workshops all over the world with teachers in all kinds of schools, I've never once, not once in years of presenting, ever had anyone say, to get a five on the AP, or to get a 1600 on the SATs, or to get admission to this particular college. And the reason for that is that we know that is not the ultimate purpose of school-based education. Teachers often say lofty, visionary things like to give students a love for learning so that they continue learning forever, to inspire, to awake, the curiosity and have it continue for life, to give students the skills, content, and inspiration for learning that they'll need to carry them through the rest of their academic careers and their professional careers. These are great ideals and they're great answers to this question. And in general, it's really interesting because if we look at our answers to this question, and then we reflect on our daily teaching practices for all sorts of good reasons, there can often be a disconnect. We often get stuck teaching to the test, racing against the clock with a curriculum we've been handed down, or worrying about particular standards or state tests that are hovering overhead like some kind of looming deadline that we can't escape. But those really don't align with our answer to this question. So I just like to start with this question to have it firmly in mind. And sometimes I even recommend that you, you know, hone, hone this question to really make, hone your answer to really make it be what you, you really believe through and through as an educator, and then tack it up behind your desk where you're gonna see it every day as a reminder, a kind of through line to everything you do um, to infuse your teaching with that. So I just wanna start with that because I think it's an important baseline for us to think about as we think about what it means to truly learn. What does the world want? We're producing students, you know, pre-K through 16 and beyond that will go off into the world and help shape it and change it for all of us and generations to come. So what does the world actually want? Those of us working in K to 12 education, um, you know, we're often sort of guessing as to what we think colleges and careers are really looking for. And we're not always using the most informed stances to answer this question. What does the world want from us? What does the world want from our graduates? What do they need in high school graduates who are ready for, for the next stage? Well, when I consider that question, I'm struck by an article I read a couple years ago about my son's favorite basketball team, the Golden State Warriors. And um, they had a really interesting halftime routine that struck me. Steve Kerr, the, the longtime championship coach, um, has a halftime routine. Um, and you can just read the quote from the New York Times article where I read about it right here. That line, everybody is a leader here, really struck me. 
because it's exactly the philosophy I use every day in spider web discussion in my classroom. Everybody should be a leader. Everybody should have the chance to lead. Everybody should have a voice at the table and space to make their voice heard. I often think about uh, a really interesting um, study that came out of um, a Harvard economist's work, uh, David Deming. Um, this came out several years ago now, and he had studied for a couple decades, a few decades really, um, the change in share of jobs from 1980 to 2012. And he found some interesting things that I think are relevant to all of us trying to answer that question, what does the world want? And basically, you can dig into the, the study itself and the articles that were written about it. But basically, he saw that um, jobs that were technical only in nature declined. Now, we might guess that, um, you know, technical jobs that were not high skilled, uh, for example, engineers, um, you know, things like auto mechanics, truck drivers, laborers, welders, those jobs might you know, we might understand why they're in decline as there's more and more automation, more and more robots doing things that humans used to do. But what he found that was really interesting, it wasn't only automated jobs that really were um, being lost. It was automated jobs. It was mechanical, technical jobs that didn't re require interpersonal skills. So the jobs that had the most growth were related, like including computer scientists, right? Very technical fields, um, but also including police, um, nurse aides, health technicians, right? These jobs all grew because they require interpersonal skills. The more social skills required, the more growth that Deming saw over 30 year period. So interestingly, even jobs like high skilled engineers that weren't working in teams, that were just sort of using their own particular skills to crunch numbers and, and, um, and develop machinery, were actually losing jobs over this 30 year period. And he noted this in the article I read about it, which really struck me as an educator. This Harvard economist noted that we start schooling with an environment that looks a lot like the real world does. It's job sharing, it's communication, it's negotiating, it's figuring out what upsets and pleases other people and working together to pool our resources to you know, build blocks or color something or put on a play. Um, but he noted that as school continues, we sort of replace that with this teaching of what he calls hard skills um, and less peer interaction. Now, of course, this isn't true everywhere, and it's never been true of schools that are really focused on project based learning and collaborative approaches. Um, but I think a lot of us can recognize the truth in this. And I've interviewed students who say they've lost their sort of spark. They used to love to be creative and collaborative, and now they just need to get specific grades or scores or get the information down so they can spit it out and get what they need to to get to the next level. And so he said work really is more like preschool now. And we've sort of lost something in between those preschool and work years that actually doesn't quite align anymore with the end goal of what the world wants. So we've got to rethink this a bit as educators. Another study that I really love to look at as, as the why behind something like spiderweb discussion being so powerful is Google's Project Oxygen. About 10 years ago, Google decided to crunch some numbers and see what made their best managers so great and what made their you know low performing managers not perform so well. They are a data company and they said, well, let's look at the data. And so they they did this really interesting study called Project Oxygen. It was not tied to any work evaluation. 
Um, so people were sort of free to answer honestly and not fear any kind of repercussions. Um, so uh, basically they crunched the numbers and they found eight factors, the big eight, they called them, that led to high performing managers doing well. They found that when managers had these eight qualities, they did better. They led better teams. They had better um, ratings and less turnover in their teams. And so they were deemed really great managers. So here were the eight qualities. Um, I'm just going to highlight four that I think are relevant. Um, be a good coach. Empower your team and don't micromanage. Be productive and results oriented. So have that end goal in mind. And be a good communicator and listener. That's really key. Now, interestingly, these top big eight qualities were ranked in order of importance. And the eighth, the last, was have key technical skills so you can help advise the team. In education terms, that's our content. So the least important of the important skills was the content. The seven that came before it were really about teamwork, communication, management skills, interpersonal, soft skills, as Dr. Deming would say. Google also determined there were a couple pitfalls in the worst managers. One of them was having trouble making a transition to the team, too solo a worker, too independent a thinker and worker. So that team skill is really important to success. And spending too little time managing and communicating, that communication piece is key too. And actually Google was able to target these specific big eight and the pitfalls and make a statistical improvement in the majority of their managers. So that was really a, a neat sort of finding, not only for Google and the business world, but I think also for education. Soft skills are the most valuable skills in the real world that translate to success, at least according to Google's Project Oxygen. So what does the world want? We see a little bit of this in some of these studies and outcomes. What do they want? Well, I love this story that I was told by um, Ron Richard, uh, professor of education at Harvard um, Education School. And he tells a story about um, Dow Chemical, which runs an internship program um, out in California every summer for the best and the brightest of the area. And they give the students a, a chemistry puzzle to solve a, a problem as part of the application process. And the woman who runs the internship program was very frustrated with the recent crop of students. And she cited to Ron Richard, um, who is part of the Project Zero um, Visible Thinking initiative out of Harvard that you may have heard of. And she was lamenting to him saying, you know, uh, there was a young man who who was working on the chemistry problem for about 10 minutes and then came out and said, I, I give up, what's the answer? And she said, young man, we don't solve chemistry problems we know the answer to. That's the real world. We don't have an answer code at the back of the book in the real world. We're actually solving real problems. And that story that Ron Richard told was a, an absolute light bulb moment for me sitting in the audience when I watched him because I realized that most of K-12 education, at least high school for sure, is asking students to solve problems that we all know the answers to. What would school look like if it was a series of questions and problems that no one knew the answers to. What could the possibilities be if we asked questions and posed problems that really plague all of us about epidemics, climate change, equity and justice? What would happen if we posed questions that none of us knew the answer to, but all of us have an invested interest in and could benefit from the exploration, the research, the problem solving for? That really was a powerful moment for me. Another story that Ron Richard told that I really liked that resonated with me as an educator is a story about a friend of his who had gotten uh, graduated from UC Davis, gotten an internship at Tesla, and was a bit intimidated by all of the other interns there who'd graduated from MIT and Caltech. And, and he felt like maybe his resume wasn't quite as 
top notch as, as his peers, but he did the internship. And at the end of the internship, he was the only person who was offered a job at Tesla out of all the interns. And when he was offered the job, he was flattered, but he asked, why me? There are so many better prepared people here, people who have great pedigrees and, and resumes and experience. Why, why did I get the job? And they replied at Tesla, you asked the best questions. You asked such important questions, questions we haven't been asking ourselves that we're gonna give you an entire team to work with to ask and answer those questions at Tesla. Wow, that's an interesting thing that the world wants. Great question askers. The World Economic Forum every five years comes out with sort of a list of the top skills that the world is looking for. And their latest one, which is several years old now, so they'll probably be updating soon, is the following. We can see how it compares to the previous five years. So in 2015, um, creativity was number 10. But in 2020, the top 10 skills, creativity jumps to number three as a desired skill, according to the World Economic Forum uh, report. Now, look at this list for the 2020 complex problem solving critical thinking creativity people management coordinating with others emotional intelligence negotiation these are all things we see borne out in the research i've already cited by google um, things like the tesla anecdote so we see this kind of convergence of how important the soft skills are of course along with the content that we need uh, our students to have. But those soft skills are really what the world is asking for. They're much harder to teach. They're much harder to train on the job. I once knew a banker who, um, she was a leadership specialist and she was coordinating several banks all over Asia. And she said, give me a good critical thinker and a good writer any day. I will train them from the ground up with the technical skills that I need them to have. But I cannot and do not have the time to teach someone how to write or how to communicate well and be emotionally intelligent. I need them to do that from day one. That's what the world wants. So if that's what the world wants, here is the question. If the world needs excellent communicators, listeners, negotiators, creative thinkers, question askers. What are you and I doing daily? Not once a semester, not as an activity every once in a while, but daily, every single day in our classrooms to teach, encourage, and assess these skills. I have one tool that I have developed that does all of these things. It's called spiderweb discussion. It's a kind of discussion that is student-led, inquiry-based, and it encourages to think, it encourages everyone who does it, the students, to think critically, question, empathize with each other, listen, build on each other's ideas, and self-assess the process in the end. The students will give themselves a group grade at the end they'll be working as a team of one, practicing all of the skills that the world wants. And the result has changed my classroom forever. It is a complete shift in culture, in thinking, in learning, and I will never go back. So I just wanna share with you a little bit of the how and why spider web discussion is so powerful little bit about the research behind why I believe this method is something that can change every classroom in every subject matter at any age, whether it's in class, online, with adults, with kids. I believe that using the protocols that I've designed for spider web discussion, you can change any student into a learning leader and show them that they have the power to offer the world what it needs. If you'd like to hear more, I encourage you to pick up my book, 
on any one of the major booksellers, Amazon, ASCD, Barnes and Noble. It's called The Best Class You Never Taught by Alexis Wiggins. And you can also sign up for workshops that I offer from time to time or sign up for my newsletter. It's at sealcenter.org. That's C-E-E-L-C-E-N-T-E-R.org. I look forward to seeing you there. And please keep changing the world with all the wonderful things you're doing in the classroom.